The reason I'm late today, we had a visiting professor in Calgary and they wanted me to stay and show some cases to the visiting professor, so I stayed for that and that made me just late enough to not get to the airport on time. But I had enough time to drive up to Edmonton. <laughs> So I started the drive up to Edmonton, and then I got a flat tire between Airdrie and Balzac. So when I left, last left my truck, the nice man who works for AMA, who had left his shooting of Duck Dynasty, was busy jacking the car up, and my poor, long-suffering wife was standing, having handed the keys to me to her car, while she waited for the spare tire to be put on. So I then rushed to the airport and got into the next flight. Got on to the next flight. So, um, and I'm not really sure why I'm here, because there are 40 orthopedic surgeons in Edmonton, and all of them do a great total hip and a great total knee, so I'm not sure why I had to struggle to get up here. Don, you, I, why don't you just come up and do this? I see, that's what it is, okay. It's a privilege to work with all of the smart people who um, are involved in all of these initiatives, it truly is. And what's my role as a clinician? Well, I thought the, the, the thing that would probably best explain all of that would be to put this slide up. And on the left-hand side, you can see ham and egg breakfast. And on the right-hand side, you can see the chicken. And the clinicians are probably like the chickens. And the researchers are like the pigs. <laughs> the chickens are supportive. The pigs are certainly committed. <laughs> so the wait list actually dropped a week by a week after I did this last demonstration. So <laughs> you want to come down to Calgary, my list is dwindling after showing this. Okay, uh, are there people in, in the room that have had hip replacements? There's a few of you, and a, how about knee replacements? So despite what you heard, surgery is actually good for people. And hip replacement surgery is actually pretty spectacular, if you have to get to it. But I do realize that this is a, a bit frightening and blue collar. And there were some pretty horrified people in the audience after my last demonstration, so close your eyes if this bothers you. <laughs> How do we do a hip replacement? Well, you can make uh, an incision in the front or in the buttock or come directly from the side to expose the hip socket. And then to prepare the um, socket, what we do, <clears throat> place retractors, and then we have to take the remaining bad cartilage off the hip joint. And we do that with power tools, and orthopedic surgeons love power tools. And this, uh, that looks a little bit like a cheese grater, serves the purpose of removing the remaining cartilage. What we want to do is we want to take the cartilage off, but leave the cartilage that's, or leave the bone that's just below the cartilage in place because it's uh, the strongest bone and it's going to help us fix the socket well to the pelvis. So. So what we'll do is we'll sequentially, you got 50 socket? 52, okay. We'll sequentially prepare the hip socket here. And then we take a trial and we implant this into the pelvis in the correct position and there's um, some judgment that's involved here and there are landmarks that 
we use so that we can get the right tilt on one plane and then the right rotation in terms of backward and forward. That's why orthopedic residencies are so long now. <laughs> we went to no expense to get the right tools. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. We found out we were missing the correct hammer, so we took this out of Bill's locker. <laughs> and what you do is you tap this in until you get a feeling of uh, stability. And the, the trial makes contact with this column of bone at the front and the column of bone at the back. And we've almost got enough stability. I think I'll ream it up a touch more. And Jordan doesn't get to talk, but I can tell you at our fundraiser for our mission, this last Saturday, he had everybody in tears describing the, some of the poor people we're treating down there. So while he's a silent straight man here, he's a very good speaker. <laughs> you can see we've got enough uh, immediate stability. We've got what we call a press fit that um, we now feel pretty comfortable we can go ahead and put the definitive socket in. I don't know how well, is this projecting well? Can everybody see what's going on here? Because as you know I wasn't late to check the, or I was late and couldn't check the <laughs> setup here. Um, can we see the, oh I can see it right there. Um, we've got a beaded surface on the back of this socket and this particular socket has three screw holes in it and you can get them with no holes and little spikes on the back, no holes and just this beaded surface. Multiple holes if you're in a revision setting where you need to have uh, more options to try and get your fixation. Uh, the majority of sockets that are done in North America for hip replacement would be cement less and the majority of stems are cement less but you can also fix um, sockets and stems to bone using a grouting agent called bone cement polymethamethacrylate. So this has got a very rough high friction surface on the back of it and it's porous and the bone just loves this backside and uh, the material itself is titanium and bone is very uh, friendly with titanium so you get good bone on growth onto the back surface. We have a gadget to show us the orientation here. And at the Wood Forum in Calgary, we saw some of the work that Carolyn Anglin and her group are doing on making the implantation more precise. And certainly you can use computers to help you. Unfortunately, the computer-assisted surgery hasn't proven to be the panacea that we thought that it might with hip and knee replacement, but um, things change in advance for sure. So. Having positioned this in what we believe to be the correct orientation, we then tap it in until we get that press fit again. I was afraid you'd put that on there so tight I couldn't get it off. His other nickname on the mission is Tractor Boy. He's from Tabor. and he can fix anything that breaks on the mission, so it's another good trait of his. So we drill a hole, and then we put a depth gauge in. And then we have options in terms of the screw length, and. and it's just a threaded screw that grabs in the bone. We have an articulated tool here.
and we can, this particular socket, we could put two more in, but we've got a good press fit with one screw, so that would usually be enough. Now, inside this titanium shell, we put um, a bearing, and the, the most common bearing is uh, high molecular weight polyethylene, and it, something that is new in hip replacement, relatively speaking, is the fact that for the last 10 years, this has been cross-linked. It's cross-linked by irradiating the plastic, so the carbon fibers cross-link and make it more wear resistant. And the 10-year data, which is a relatively short time in total joint replacement, by the way, shows that uh, the wear characteristics of this cross-linked polyethylene are, are quite a bit better, and this is in advance. So we put this in so that it lines up appropriately. It's got a dovetail lock. And then we have a little introducer and we use our handy dandy 299 Canadian tire hammer. <laughs> and we tap that in and then we have a little tool that allows us to check it to make sure that it's stable. And then sometimes we have to trim a little bone from the edge here. But uh, that sort of takes care of things on the socket side. We then move over to the femur and uh, you can't, oh, perfect. In Calgary, we only had a stationary camera. I'm sure that's probably. We're more advanced. Yeah, I was thinking that, yeah. <laughs> I was certain of that. A newer building, but a mobile camera here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Only for having trouble. <laughs> so you have to dislocate the hip joint, of course, to have access to the proximal femur. And um, I tend to do this through a, what's called a posterior approach and approach from the back. So um, when I'm putting when I'm putting uh, the components in, the femur is actually upside down for me. We um, have done some templating preoperatively. We have some acetates that we can put on the uh, x-rays that let us um, project where the cuts should be so that we can restore limb length and try and get that as correct as possible. But we can also restore the tension in the soft tissues by having correct what we call offset. So this guide shows me how to, where to make the cut, what angle, and we don't have a pen. Oh, I took one of these off the desk on the way in here, so. <laughs> University of Alberta, it's a fake pen. <laughs> Really? Can I scribble on this tablecloth? Okay. Well, I'm going to talk to the planning committee for next year. <laughs> Can I have the... Most of the time we don't mark it out anyway. So having um, determined where we should make this cut, we then use the saw and we cut across the... It was about this point, I think, that I saw a whole bunch of people reaching for their cell phones <laughs> to cancel their upcoming hip surgery. Airport about to pick Jim up. His wife, I told him make sure he doesn't drop the femoral head on the floor. <laughs> and I did last time actually. <laughs> and I assured people that it never happened. 
Well, almost never. <laughs> now, the fact that my wife has worked with me in the operating room, she's been my scrub nurse, uh, maybe tells you there's a little more that she knows that I shouldn't tell you, but <laughs> that's for you. Don, are you sure you don't want to help me? How am I doing? You're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't heard any complaining. <laughs> so what we do is we take a little bone out of the top so that we can get the correct orientation to put the stem down the canal. And uh, I'm going to need... Can everybody see what's going on here? Yes. Those, that, those that want to. Sorry, my jacket, okay. <laughs> you want me to take my jacket off or just stand out of the road here? How's that? Can everybody see now? Hooray! Okay. I'll get Bass back next year. Okay. All the ringer. Okay. So how do we know what size implants to put into people? Well, um, there's an array of hip stems in terms of the diameter, and they go up in one millimeter increments. The sockets go up in two millimeter increments. And uh, if we're operating on really small people, and there's, we operate on dwarfs from time to time, we have to get smaller components in. And uh, sometimes you operate on great big people and you have to make sure that you've ordered the big people components in from central Canada. So, but for most of the time, because they have a warehouse in central Canada. <laughs> Not that's because all the big people are there. <laughs> um, so for those of you who are wondering if we have the right size implant, all the people in this room, we'd have the right size implant for you. So. That's how, that's how we do it. So what we're looking for when we're preparing this is we want good contact between the stem and the bone. And um, when we start to get resistance, when we're putting these cutting tools in, that's how we know we're approaching the point where we're gonna get good contact. I really story to stand in front of you people here. But you can see the screen. Okay. So after we've reamed, and you know, different systems have different um, um, specifications in terms of reaming and broaching, we put this cutting tool down that has sharp edges on it. It's called a broach. The other thing I'll tell you is that this bone is very brittle, the saw bones. So it's um, possible that I could crack this saw bone here, which never happens in real life, but can happen during a demonstration. Thank you. That was an 11 12 reamer, right? Yeah. Did I use a lateralizing tool? No. Okay. So this is the brooch that corresponds with the diameter of the reamer that I used. put this down until it's solidly fixed in the canal and then we slip this off and we can put a trial neck on and we can put the, here's the trial neck. 
So we put a trial ball in place. And uh, we have different neck lengths on this. We also have different ball diameters. As a general rule, the bigger the diameter of the ball, the more stable the hip is. And dislocation is certainly one of, always one of our potential concerns after hip replacement. So we like to get the biggest ball on that we can, but um, every bearing has its up and down side, and I'll show you some bearing options here in a minute. So we would put this trial head on, and then we would put the hip back into position to see what the tension was in the soft tissues. And if we like it, great. We can move on and put the definitive components in. If we're not happy with the tension in the soft tissues uh, and the stability of the hip, then we can change these and put perhaps a little longer neck on or if we'd wanted to um, use a bigger bearing diameter, we could even back up and take that liner out and put another liner in. So these are versatile, these modular systems, very versatile. And this isn't even the most versatile system. The, the people with the complex deformity, uh, like, for example, the dwarfs, one of the systems that we have available to us uh, has 8,000 different possible combinations. So that's astonishing. And I once actually had a, a dwarf who was so tiny that I used the smallest of absolutely everything and it was just perfect for her. So, so having trialed the hip, we then go ahead, pardon me, we go ahead and, um, sorry, how am I doing time-wise, Linda? You gonna hook me? Five minutes. Five minutes? There we go. Now, I don't know if the person is in the room who was sitting with Nigel Shrive last time, but whoever they were, they, they apparently said after my last presentation, I didn't know he had a sense of humor. <laughs> Nigel shared that with me today, so. <laughs> By the way, he sends his regrets that he couldn't come, so. Well, I'm, I'm not very jolly with AHS, but... <laughs> I've also noticed they're not very jolly with me sometimes. <laughs> the cut and thrust. Tracy, you're a nurse. I should have had you come up here and help me be my assistant. <laughs> you haven't told them how my elbow was hammered and so I was cost estimate. Well, that, we're not allowed to know that. <laughs> so it's like going to those restaurants where the lady gets the menu, there's no price. The surgeons get the joints, the instruments, but you don't know what the price is. And actually, to their credit, they're engaging us and telling us, what these things cost, and they have surgeons on their implant selection committee who look at the quality of the product and the cost, and we all are committed to trying to provide the right implant to you, but get it as cost effectively as we can, so. Is that what I was supposed to say, Tracy? <laughs> <laughs> She'll never be in the same room with me with a mic again. Okay. <clears throat> So just to wrap things up here, we put the stem in. I should have showed you the beaded surface on the stem. You have another one? <clears throat> so it's got a beaded surface. There's all kinds of different philosophies on the, there we go. All kinds of different philosophies on the stem. You can some get their fixation at the lower half and some get their fixation up at the top. This is designed to give you fixation up at the top. <clears throat> Pardon me. And it's got some little fins in it to help give a rotational control. So, old-fashioned total hips, which have a tremendous track record, I might add, use metal and it's cobalt chrome on the old-style polyethylene. But they have a tremendous track record. Um, and so we do lots of 
good old-fashioned metal on plastic bearing surfaces. So we'd put the cobalt chrome head on here and then we'd impact it and then we'd put the hip in place. There are some other bearings that are um, possible to use. How, anybody got a ceramic on ceramic hip? Fantastic. It's a good bearing, but there's no free lunches. Ceramics can squeak. <laughs> I don't know if yours does. I, I put a ceramic hip in a friend of mine, and um, <clears throat> he happens to, uh, he was my son's football coach. And so nine years later, I phoned Paul to talk to him. Uh, and Paul said, just a minute, I got to go upstairs and get something to write this down. So he happened to hold the satellite phone next to his hip. <laughs> he went up the stairs and it squeaked all the way up. I said, Paul. So he came in to see me and he's happy with his hip. He has no pain, but occasionally they squeak. So the other thing that can happen with ceramic is it can fracture because it's a more brittle material. It doesn't happen very often, but occasionally the head will just suddenly explode and that kind of spoils your day. Spoils your surgeon's day too. Pardon me? No, I don't know about bone china. That seems even more delicate. Um, anyway, you can use the ceramic head, and, and I think the figure in terms of the fracture is one in ten thousand or something. So it's rare. It's very, very uncommon. You can put ceramic on here, and then you can have a ceramic on polyethylene barrack, or you can actually put ceramic on ceramic. And ceramic, of course, is the toughest material, material next to diamond. We don't have diamond-coated total hips yet. And I'm not making a joke, people talk about that all the time, because if, if you could do that, you could even have a, a better bearing in the, in the sense of friction and durability if they could engineer that. Um, because of the problem of ceramic head fracture, you can get a ceramicized metal. This is called oxinium, and it's used in, I think, the mining industry. That's where I first was told it was used. And so it's got sort of an outer ceramic layer, and then it's got metal inside. And this is pretty good for people with metal allergies. In fact, it's used in patients who have metal allergies that need total knees pretty commonly. And you can put this against polyethylene. So, And then, of course, you can put metal on metal, and metal on metal got a lot of bad press. Metal on metal, total hip replacements. The old ones actually worked pretty well, the small diameter ones. We went through uh, a period in the mid, uh, well, the middle part of the last decade, I guess, where we put in both metal on metal hip resurfacings and we continue to do that. And the results are really spectacular in men. If you're a man with osteoarthritis under the age of 65, the Canadian data matches, the Australian data matches, the British data, that it, it's at least as good as hip replacements at 10 years. Um, if you're a woman, the results are not as good at, in the Canadian data as hip replacements at five years. So we've quit, or at least I've quit, and I think most surgeons have quit doing hip resurfacing in women except in extraordinary circumstances. Metal on metal total hips didn't fare very well and there are some systems that have been particularly um, troublesome and I think everybody has pretty much quit using metal on metal total hips. So that's a little tour of the hip joint. Thank you very much for your attention.